Thank you, and, and good morning. Um, and I guess as well, I'd like to share uh, uh, Peter's sentiment so far as thanking uh, David and his team for including me in this fantastic summit. So it denotes the start of a 20-year journey. And I think um, for that reason, what I've chosen to do is really talk about our journey in, in Toronto and share some lessons learned from our journey, because we're in about year 11 of a 20-year journey. And uh, there's a lot of similarities between what we do in Toronto and what you're proposing to do in Sydney. And that's why I'm quite excited to be here. So I, first of all, I'm going to tell you just a bit of context about Toronto and the project, and then I want to talk more in more depth about not what we've done, but how we've done it, and how we've challenged, uh, how we've uh, faced some of those challenges. So Toronto is a, a great global city. Uh, we've got about uh, uh, five million in the greater Toronto area. It's um, 240 ethnic groups from 169 countries and 140 languages spoken. It's one of the most diverse uh, culturally diverse uh, cities in the world. We have about 110,000 immigrants a year coming into, this, into the Greater Toronto Area. We get about 40% of Canada's net immigration, so it's actually uh, driven a boom over the last 10 years and, and kind of uh, helped us to a large degree avoid a lot of the issues of the, uh, the last recession. We're selling about uh, between 20 and 25,000 condos a year uh, in Toronto. And of course, we're also a gateway to North America. Uh, we have access to 135 million people within a 90-minute flight or a one-day truck drive. Uh, and of course, we're part of the North American Free Trade Agreement with 500 people. And several weeks ago, we signed a European Free Trade, another 500 million people. So we have a, a billion-person uh, free trade arrangement. And we're, we rank fourth on the Economist Intelligent Unit's most livable cities in 2013. So we're a very a rapidly growing city. Uh, we have the largest number of high-rise constructions uh, under the world, and we have half the tower cranes of North America there. So, aboard the project, uh, we're involved in a very large project. This is 2,000 acres right next to the CBD of the country's economic capital. Uh, it's about um, $34 billion of total investment land for uh, 40,000 residential units, so a community of 100 to 110,000 people, 10 million square feet of office space, plus retail, cultural, entertainment, recreation, and so on and so forth. The total um, public sector investment for sewer, roads, water parks, and so forth is about six to eight billion dollars. So let me just give you a sense of how big that is in comparison. Uh, you've got Battery Park in New York City, about 97 acres. You've got uh, Canary Wharf in London, about 300 acres, the same size as, as the bays roughly. And Waterfront Toronto at 2,000 acres. So even in Torontonians don't recognize quite how large the project is. But I want to stress, it's also a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I've heard that today a number of times, or rather yesterday, and it really, really is important. Uh, these kinds of things don't come along uh, more than once in a century, and you've just got to get it right. You've got to take the time to do it right. And thinking back on Tuesday's section about financing, I would encourage you to make sure you don't get trapped into a financing structure that forces you to do a bad deal to make a bond payment. So just think about that as you go forward, making sure you, you don't lose your principles. Uh, and this is where, why uh, I think we're so similar to what David and his team are doing. It's about waterfront revitalization, not redevelopment. It's not about peddling real estate. It's about really being guided by public policy. How do you stop urban sprawl? We can't keep building bungalows to Niagara Falls. How do you promote sustainability, design excellence, transit, uh, housing for all Canadians? You just don't want to build an enclave for the uber-rich, like most waterfronts have become. So how do you build city building in its broadest sense because what we want to do, really, is we want to attract and retain, by building a great quality of life, attract and retain top talent. That's what will protect our quality of life and make the city, the province, and the country competitive for the next century. And I think you're doing the same sort of thing here. And you are competing globally. You're not competing with Melbourne anymore. You're competing with New York and London and, dare I say, Toronto. So our structure is a bit odd. We are a tripartite organization, so all three governments, the city, the, uh, your state or our province, and the federal government all support us. Uh, that makes life quite challenging at times, I assure you. Uh, but what it does do, it protects our vision. Because I've been through uh, three prime ministers, four premiers, soon to be the fourth mayor, uh, and innumerable ministers, and yet they flip-flop back and forth, left to right, but having three parties at the table actually allows us to preserve that vision going through for 20 years plus. Our structure is fairly similar. Uh, board of directors with uh, all three stakeholders represented on that board, along with the uh, no politicians except for the mayor. 
So the business model really is we've been granted $1.5 billion of seed capital, $500 million from each government, plus control of land. And there's about 85% public ownership of that 2,000 acres. And the intent is to take the seed capital, invest in infrastructure, sell the land, take the profit, reinvest in infrastructure, sell the land, and so on and so forth. Now that doesn't get us to the six to eight billion dollars because land price is still too cheap in Toronto. We're probably between 40 to 50 dollars per GFA. And you're, I would say here you're probably maybe twice that or more. So it, it doesn't really uh, uh, get us all the way, but it certainly uh, moves our capital program forward. So we invest in the enabling infrastructure, uh, the environmental remediation, the flood protection, roads and services, we get the zoning from the city. We negotiate what we call our Section 37, which is your typical sort of extraction clause. Uh, what we want to do is bring certainty to the market. We leave the market with construction risk and market risk, and that's all. Uh, they can quite, hopefully, quite handily cope with that. We take all the soil risk and all the other risks that are uh, non-quantifiable. We then go out through an RFQ, an RFP process, and we select the developers for land that bring the highest value. Not the highest price necessarily, but the highest value. And you weigh that on price because it's a public asset, on design quality, on a whole bunch of factors to make sure you're bringing in developers. In short, you're bringing in developers who get it. And uh, we've been very successful so far in bringing in developers that get it. Our role is to master plan the waterfront. We're not the regulatory agency. The City of Toronto is the regulatory agency, but we work and, uh, with them and prepare the precinct plans. And we've worked on three precinct plans so far. And I would mention here with the bays that you can't get, you can't get too far ahead. We don't precinct plan anything that isn't going to be delivered to the market within 10 years. Because if you do something that's 15 or 20 years out, you're going to have to redo it. Because things will have changed by the time the market gets there. And I would suggest that your project's misnamed. It shouldn't be the Bay's precinct, it should be the Bay precincts, plural. You put the S in the wrong spot because you have distinct areas that are probably going to develop in the marketplace at different times. So you want to think about that as you move forward. You may create a separate master plan, but don't get into the details too far ahead of the marketplace. This is, I can't emphasize this enough, we are very focused on consulting with the public. Uh, Joe Berridge uh, told me uh, this morning he thought that Toronto probably was 10 times as much as any other city, and that's probably the case. But the mayor-elect told me uh, last week, he said, well, but no one hears a peep about what we do. We basically ensure that we go through a very extensive process of consultations with the public, stakeholders, public stakeholders, and so on and so forth, until we get to uh, City Hall for approval. And typically we get people deputing in our favor, saying, let the politicians get out of the way. And I know it takes more work and, it's more, and more patience required, but when you get to the end of the day, you get a better decision because the people who live next door know a lot more than somebody who parachutes in from Toronto, uh, and you get a decision that's far stickier. You don't get that. Politicians want to see consensus at the end of the day, and you get that through heavy public consultation. I think urban growth has to be seen, has to be and be seen as the great public steward of the waterfront. That's really important. Um, we have the same situation as you do in the city. We need to reclaim the waterfront for the people. It's been, been uh, it's full, it's, it's actually waterfront land that's filled uh, starting in 1880. Um, huge challenges there, no bearing capacity, high water table, all brownfield. Uh, it's really uh, pretty grim. And we have to create this high quality of place. To be competitive for those creative workers, that are driving the economy. Cities need to offer that quality of place. And we're doing it by leading our revitalization with great parks and public realm. Uh, and we're doing it for three reasons. We've had 200 years of studies on the waterfront. The first one was done in 1793. So I heard the Minister of Planning mention that, I think, on Tuesday, that uh, they had lots of studies in, in uh, Sydney as well. Well, we've had 200 years of them. So by starting with the parks, we really reinforce the fact that this time, we're really doing it. And to Peter's point, we're also setting the bar high. We're making sure if we build great parks, developers will take advantage of that and build great buildings. And of course, if the business model is to take the government land and sell it, well, by building a park, we're adding value to that land before we sell it. So it helps our economics. So there's three great reasons, and they're all working out quite well. In fact, we have either built or improved 23 new major pieces of uh, public realm so far. And they're really critical to the development of new neighborhoods. They help create a sense of identity, a sense of place. There's some there there, finally. And I, I think we firmly believe that, that great cities are defined by their public realm, not their buildings. And that really is really a, a very important feature that we're taking to heart. 
Uh, we're looking for design excellence. Uh, you know, great design informs everything else. Uh, it's beautiful as well as functional. And what we've done to drive that is we've attracted some of the best talent around the world. When we do uh, talent calls, we look for uh, designers from around the world. Uh, we've actually won over 60 design awards so far in the last 10 years. In fact, I noticed a, a shout out from Popular Science uh, last week, their December issue, identifies our Corktown Common as one of the best of the best that they have every year in, in public spaces, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. Um, we also have international design competitions. Again, we don't limit ourselves to Toronto or Ontario or, or Canadian talent. We bring in the best from around the world. We feel a study deserves that. Um, in, in the first one we did to design the central waterfront, we had 38 submissions from 17 countries and I think four continents. Uh, and it was a challenge to, uh, to get the, uh, the right one selected, but we got a great result with uh, West 8 out of Rotterdam. So it, it really has paid off. We're also, uh, we've created Canada's third design review panel. Anything that gets done in our waterfront area has to go through the design review panel. So we have volunteer architects and landscape architects and planners sitting on this panel commenting on designs as they're submitted by either us in building infrastructure or uh, various developers in submitting proposals for our plans. It's a, quite a humbling experience for them, but it does, I think, elevate the quality of design. In you know, our chair, when we appointed him, our, our design review panel chair, said he wanted architects and designers who, not, who knew between good architecture and great architecture. So we're really striving for great quality and it certainly has paid off in raising that bar. One of the things we've done as well is try to ensure that in the public realm you're getting consistency of design. I think Battery Park's done a good job this way. When you walk along the edge of the water in Battery Park, you know you're in public space. The handrails, the surfaces and so forth, the curbing, it's all consistent. In our central waterfront, every key is different and you don't know if you're in public space or in the condo's backyard. So what we're doing is you're really trying to drive a consistent design right across the three and a half kilometers on the waterfront for the public realm. And that really will tell people intuitively that it's their space, it's not privatized space. We're also ensuring we provide waterfront views. Uh, Peter talked about that in, in uh, the importance of that in his commentary. Uh, what we're doing is tearing away from the water. So we're sort of saying at the water's edge, it's four to six stories and moves up at the main street, eight to 10 stories and back against the expressway, 50 stories or more depending. So it's really making sure we're protecting those waterfront views and giving more views to more people. And of course, that adds value as well. But we had, have had a sort of a public resistance to the wall of condos on the waterfront for trying to ensure we preserve those views as best as we can. Here's another key factor we decided. Looking, when we started our waterfront journey 11 years ago, we looked at 32 different waterfronts around the world. And one of the things we noticed was you really want to ensure that you don't put private residences at grade at public edges, either the park edges or the water's edge. What happens is residential use tends to unofficially privatize public space. So we insist on cafes or community uses, institutional uses, retail, anything public, not private residential. It's not, no problem above the second floor and so forth, but at grade, you see what happens is the flower pots start moving out, the benches start moving out, and you get that private encroachment. Melmo has that problem. Thames River has that problem. And it doesn't work for the residents, it doesn't work for the public. So that was a bun fight we had that really, uh, we've stuck to our guns on that because it's been very important to preserve that public realm, of the water's edge, the public space. We're also trialing uh, on a pilot basis, living streets, they're called wood earths. These are streets that are side streets that are basically uh, pedestrianized. So no one has the right of way, there's no signage, there's very little curbing, just enough for the, the blind and impaired. Um, but people can walk, bicycle, or drive their cars on these streets. And because there is no right of way, uh, what happens effectively, everybody takes care. So normally, when I'm driving down the road in my car, I know curb to curb, black stuff, that's mine. Here, it's everybody's. And so everybody takes care. It's a pilot project. And I would also uh, highly recommend the use of the term pilot project. I heard yesterday about how governments are afraid of experimental. Pilot projects are okay, because there's an expectation some are gonna fail. So it's actually worked very well for us to say, well, no, it's just a pilot, it's just a pilot. And we'll see how it works, and if it works well, we'll carry on. If it doesn't, we'll forget about it. So this is the pilot program that we started, because typically uh, the operating authorities don't like interlock, uh, because a snowplow sometimes catches it if it's not done well. And uh, so, but we've, we've really, you know, 
and the engineers, and I'm an engineer, so I can say this. I mean, they love these manuals and these standards and so forth, but we've tried to create different kinds of spaces and different kinds of uses as we go forward. We have an unusual public art program. I don't know what a Sydney has, but New York, London, Toronto has this public art contribution required from developers. So you, if you have a $100 million building of your hard cost, you've got to put a million dollars aside, 1% aside for public art. And it typically ends up with you know, stuff stuck in the back lobby or out in the backyard and so forth. What we've done with government health is say, rather than do that, let's us bankroll the public art in highly visible public spaces on a theme basis and collect the money from the developers afterwards so we get a much more robust, a much more important, a much more value-adding public art program at no cost to the public. We developed our sustainability framework in 2005 to start off with, and that was really uh, to direct how we planned, designed, maintained, operated all our assets. And so uh, we started off with lead gold, and we enforced that through our minimum green building requirements. And every developer who buys land through us, from the city, the province, or ourselves, has to sign on to the minimum green building requirements. So these started off as lead gold, uh, as the benchmark, and they've moved up over time as the market has become more mature. So, for example, uh, last year we introduced a new factor. We said, we're worried about the condos. Developers do a great job of building what sells tomorrow. So 500 square foot units are selling tomorrow. Well, unfortunately, under the type of construction they're using, they're 500 square feet forever. So what happens in 10, 20, and 30 years' time? So we've said, no, you can't build with shear walls anymore. Shear walls are the block walls between units that resist the wind shear. You've got to build column and frame like an office building so that floor plate's flexible. So if a young person buys a unit today, in 10 years, they do have a chance of buying their neighbor and expanding it. So the housing stock is more flexible. We're also saying above grade parking garages, you can't build on a slant. Got to be flat, got to have minimum heights, so you can change that use after when, when uh, in 10 or 20 or 30 years' time when, in fact, cars are not as prevalent. The challenge all, in all this is really how do you plan for the future and accommodate tomorrow? We've also got huge brownfield issues. Everything is filled that we're on. So you name a contaminant, and I've got it somewhere for you. Uh, it's, we have to take out two million cubic meters of uh, brownfield soil and bring a million cubic meters back in. And we did a study to say, well, the typical approach is what we call dig and dump. The, the guy comes in, excavates it, takes it up north, and sticks it in another hole. Uh, and that, we didn't feel, was really the right thing to do. So we looked at the cost of that. And between road wear and tear, because this is an extra 50 million kilometers of truck traffic, road wear and tear, accidents, congestion, fatalities, Public health, because we're a single-payer health system, the cost was $65 million if we did nothing. So what we said is, well, let's, let's find a way. Let's see if we can recycle it, treat it. So we ran some pilot programs, see if we can wash it and, and, and reuse it. And then we brought a private sector operator in to actually run the business. In order to attract him, we said, OK, we'll guarantee you a feedstock. We'll tell our developers that you've got to take your soil to this site, provided that it doesn't cost you any more. So no cost to the public, no land discount, and he's got a, an assumption of, of feedstock that he can use then to run the business. And that's working quite well. We're also concerned about street trees. The average life of a street tree in Toronto is between five and seven years because of soil compaction, lack of irrigation, and so forth. So what we're putting in are these soil cells. Every tree has th 30 cubic meters of uncompacted soil forever. And this grill I just see in the right insert there is fiberglass and steel and a lid and it supports the paving materials and it support truck traffic but there's 30 cubic meters for every tree, and they're thriving really well. And we have 34,000 trees to, to uh, install in the waterfront, of which 16,800 were gonna have to have this treatment. Quite expensive, but we want the trees to be generational. They should last 60, 70, 80 years, not five, six, or seven. Aquatic health is an issue. We're trying to ensure that as we plan along the water's edge, we're not, thinking, we're not forgetting about what happens in the water. So we've done marine studies to look at the boating uses. We've also looked at what happens on the aquatic side. So we've actually prepared uh, subsurface uh, improvements to provide better fish habitat. So fish species have gone from five to about 17 in the harbor in the last 10 years. Early transit's important. as part of our sustainability study. People are vulnerable to change when they change their residential unit or they change their job location. In Hammer Michaustead, the project Joe mentioned yesterday, they went from a 30% modal split using transit to over 70% by having transit there within 18 months of the first occupants. If you wait two or three years, it's too late. They're in their cars and you'll never change. So the issue is to get it there early. Easier said than done, but it's, I thought I put in a failure. 
Uh, we tried to uh, put in district energy. Great system. It future-proofs the neighborhood. You can, once the system's plumbed, you can basically change the source of energy. The problem with this is that it requires all the capital up front before your first customer arrives. And if you're in a greenfield site where you've got customers coming on stream over 20 years, the interest lock kills the business. So what we did instead is we put zoning in place to say, when it comes, you've got to sign up for it if it's commercially available. And for the existing developers who are already there, we've convinced them to put in Siamese connections for future uh, hookup, and we've convinced them to put in heat exchangers in the in-suite units that handle the delta T from a DE system as opposed to a boiler. So they're selling those business as DE ready. So it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a compromise situation. We're also transforming space under as a series of overpasses. So we're using the overpasses as free roofs. So we've got Underpass Park, first in Canada. Uh, and it transforms these ugly, dark spaces where the homeless hang out and the trolls live to these places where kids can play and they become community connectors. Part of our mandate, make sure we have land for 25% 20% of the housing to be affordable rental. We don't have the money for the buildings, but we certainly provide for this, because we're building uh, basically housing for all Canadians. How do you build a community when the workers have to live 50 miles uh, from out of town? So this has been quite successful. We've got about 700 units already built through various uh, uh, incentives. Also, we have, we have winter. You don't have that here, but we do. Uh, but the point is, to avoid that issue and the challenge of sterilizing the waterfront, we brought in a college. And we talked yesterday about Cornell. Our George Brown College brings 5,000 students down, and they've got to be there in January and February. So it keeps the place alive. It keeps the retailers going. It keeps everything humming. Uh, difficult to do, but uh, that deal took four years to do. We're also building infrastructure that's very smart. Uh, we're putting in Canada's first open access ultra broadband network. Uh, it's a private sector model. We've got a carrier coming in. We're getting some money from the developers. We're putting in a system. We started off with every unit in the, in the waterfront would have 100 megabits per second, synchronous, up and down, same speed, with no data caps. Uh, we, two weeks ago, we announced we moved it up to 500 megabits per second, up and down, same speed. Again, no data caps, all for 60 bucks a month. And what we hope to do is use that as an employment inducement and bring companies down who now see the waterfront as a living laboratory for, uh, for smart products. Uh, and that's, and that's um, we're also, in our business model, charging a little more to the developers than we actually pay our carrier, because we're paying our carrier to wire up every building. So the affordable rental also gets wired up for free, effectively, through this cross-subsidy. It's important because the, the divide is getting worse, and this digital inclusion issue is very important to make sure that we shrink that divide and no one gets left behind. So that's partly, again, driven by public policy. Let's talk about the dollars. Uh, we've invested about $1.3 billion so far in infrastructure. And that's already returned about $622 million of tax money. Now, this is a model we didn't cook up. This is a Statistics Canada model, so it's, uh, we think it's robust. Uh, and it shows what happens with direct, indirect, and induced taxation coming back. And of course, it shows the economic outputs and jobs and so forth. But that's just our work. And so far, we've brought about six deals to the table that uh, total about $2.6 billion of commitment from the private sector. Uh, and that's generating another $838 million of um, taxation of return. So you now have a situation where actually the government revenues are paid back. So the model in the broadest term actually does work. They get their payback. And around us, not just the ones that we brought to the table, but around us and on the private sector in our areas, there's another 44 projects that we, don't, we didn't uh, drive ourselves, but we feel that the focus on the waterfront has induced them and has been a partly a catalyst. So in small or larger fashion, we've helped move that along, and that's brought another $9.6 billion of investment, which will generate $3.2 billion of uh, tax revenue. So, you know, government investment in infrastructure can be done and it can be made in a way that generates revenues back to them. So, just quickly to show you sort of what we've done, our first precinct, Ace Bayfront, that's what it looked like before we started. This is what it looked like in eight years' time, and we're about a third of the way down that path uh, with uh, Heinz, Tridel coming in, George Brown, uh, Chorus, and other, and other uh, anchor tenants. So we're building an, an innovation corridor down this street. Uh, effectively, because of our ultra broadband, we've got an animator at one end and Pinewood at the other. So we're hoping to use that as an innovation corridor. And the West Onlands, the other precinct, this is after it was leveled. And of course, this is what it looked like and what's happening now. We've been very successful in getting the Pan Am games to come to Toronto. 
and about a, about a half of that is being developed for the games as the Pan Am Village. And what's important is we're not building barracks for the games and wondering what to do with them afterwards. We're actually, the timing was perfect. We're actually building what we had planned and had approved by the city. Uh, stacked townhouses on the side streets for families, mid-rise residential, a bit of high-rise. So the plan that we had worked for years with the community on and finally taken to council and got approved is what's getting built for the village, be used temporarily next summer, and then goes on to its eventual use. So some of it's market condo, some of it's affordable rental, we've got a student a residence there, we've got a YMCA, so all that stuff will then go into its permanent use. So the timing has been very good and it's helped catalyze uh, this whole development. And of course, the central waterfront, we thought was originally done when we arrived on the scene, but we looked at it and thought, this is a pretty ugly street. And so we're actually spending a fair amount of investment in re revamping that and creating a new Romblas or Champs-Élysées for Toronto. And this has been a very difficult project. Uh, the, key issue, the key issue here is we're taking a four-lane mismanaged road, two lanes each side to the tramway, and converting it to a two-way street on the north side and taking the south or waterside lanes and making a linear park three and a half kilometers long. So this will become our Romblas. When you come to Toronto, you'll have to walk Queen's Quay. And that will be open at the end of June next year. It's been a three-year project, been extremely difficult because of water and weather and geotechnical issues, but it's, uh, it's coming along. So we've come a long way, but we're not done yet. Uh, we've got some big nuts to crack. The Portlands is another 850 acres of part of our 2000. Uh, but it's under flood risk. So in the design flood we have to, to, to look after, uh, you'd have two-thirds of the water of Niagara Falls coming down the river and turning right. And it doesn't do that. And it floods all this area. So we have to prepare a flood protection solution, which we've been working on for probably six years now. And it involves building a new river and a, a greenway, which becomes a spillway, and maintaining existing channels. So it becomes three outlets for the water. And that really does... Um, uh, solve that issue, and it allows us then to capitalize on the land and start building uh, a very variety of uh, mixed-use uh, environments. So, if you can uh, roll the video, I just have a 15-second shot to show you what this is. What uh, we just produced it. This is what it'll look like. So we're partway down the street already. the existing channel, and then of course we come across the new river. It's, it is a, uh, it will be an interesting journey for you. Uh, it's tough, it is tough doing, uh, but I can only encourage you to uh, uh, stay the course, stick with your principles, and uh, create a great Sydney. Thank you very much.